So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about integration in transdisciplinary research projects. Um, Naomi and I are going to talk a little bit about social sciences and their approaches. Um, and that will lead into Aaron talking about qualitative interview methods. And um, Valentin will talk briefly about what he's going to have you do this afternoon. You are going to be in new groups of four people working together throughout the day, not your proposal groups, but groups you create today. And you're going to collect social science qualitative data and natural science grasslands data, and you're going to integrate them by the end of the day. So it's going to be interesting and challenging. Um, so to get going, I'm going to talk a little bit about integration and strategies for good integration in transdisciplinary uh, teams. So first of all, we all know it's very hard. Um, this is a group of people on our BioPyr project, and some of us have been working together across social, natural, and engineering sciences for more than 15 years. Um, we work together as a team very well. We really like each other. We're really good at kind of developing integrated research questions, but in terms of developing integrated output, like um, integrated published papers, that's something that we're still learning how to do well. So it's hard, it takes time. You all are getting jump started on how to do it. Um, so here are some strategies that Aaron and I developed to re we recommend to you as ways to jumpstart your integration. And this relates, you'll see some uh, connections to things you all talked about yesterday as lessons learned about transdisciplinary teamwork. It will also um, tie a lot to Gabby and Lily's presentation this morning, so you kind of see some resonance. All right, so we've talked about this a lot, the focus on developing shared goals, um, um, and then rinse and repeats from a shampoo commercial in the United States years ago. But keep, you know, you start those shared goals to begin with when you create your team, but you have to return to them as your team starts to work together over time and keep returning to them. And they'll sometimes they'll, they'll evolve, they'll change a little bit with time. Um, spend a lot of time learning about each other's goals and assumptions and approaches and, and currencies is a word that Alex used yesterday. Um, so if you have someone from an NGO on your team, someone from business on your team, and a natural scientist, and kind of what are the currencies? What are the things that help you do your job well so that you can try to protect your ability to create all those currencies in your projects? You have to spend a lot of time learning about that. That's why we're focusing on that today so that you can learn about social versus natural science methods. Um, develop integrated research questions, but also I recommend that in a, in a full project you would have some disciplinary sub-questions as well so that you're meeting everybody's goals. And keep talking and talking and talking, as you've seen over this past year, um, presenting about your subgroup activities, findings, doing periodic presentations. Aaron reminds me that the project that she and I and Tati and Valentin work on, we've presented to each other for um, four or five years about what we're doing, and we still get questions from other groups on the project about what another group is doing, as if we'd never talked about that ever. Um, so people don't always absorb things when you talk about them. You kind of have to repeat yourself. Plus, when it becomes important, like you're trying to write a paper together, then people may realize, oh, I you know, I, did, I thought I understood what you were doing, but I didn't really. So you have to be willing to repeat yourself. Um, building trust and respect, things you talked about yesterday, a commitment um, is important. Helps people stay together during the hard parts. And this is a, pro a picture from our research team when we were in Wisconsin, USA, and doing a field trip. So we're going to do a field trip as a group this week. Um, we did one in the DR. Um, those field trips, getting people 
out and together and seeing new things. They can build relationships with people. Um, Social media, we use social media on the BioPire team, um, especially Facebook. We have a Facebook group for our research team, and we can share what's going on. This Recently, we had team members who were affected by the hurricanes and the earthquakes in Mexico, um, and that was the first place people went to check in and see if everybody was okay. That builds relationships. So easier integration, so how do you get over this hard stuff? Don't be afraid, as I already said, to repeat information, keep discussing those goals, research questions, approaches, problem foci. Um, try to develop at least one question that rests on bringing different types of data together. On our BioPyr team, myself and Jesse Knowlton, who was in DR with us, we're working on a bird paper where I'm bringing together the quantitative social science data about how people in communities across the America care about birds and what they believe about good habitat for birds. And Jessie's bringing in her data about what is good habitat for birds. So we can write a paper that um, brings those together, presents that data, but then makes recommendations, all right? So so many people care about birds. Here's what's helpful for communities as they think about how to manage their landscape. They can do these things to protect birds. So it's bringing things together. But it took a long time to come to um, that idea. Use integrating concepts, and I think that as um, Aaron and Valentin talk about the grasslands research project you're going to do today, this idea of trade-offs is really helpful. So Valentin's going to help you measure some things about some grasslands. Aaron's going to help you develop some interview questions to understand how people see those grasslands and the trade-offs they're thinking about. So that can be an integrating concept that allows you to link across social and natural sciences, but also across different social actors, NGOs, environmental groups, um, government, industry, etc. Values, ecosystem services, policies can be concepts that integrate. You may need to think about multiple funding sources. So multiple different funders have different goals themselves and may want to pay money to help you do one part of your project but not the other. For instance, you might have to combine science agency with foundation money to do your project because they have different goals. You may have to get funding for your international components and funding for your national components. On the BioPyre team, the National Science Foundation in the US, which was the primary fund, didn't allow us to send money to other countries. So the II was really important in terms of being able to get an II, II grant that could um, use money to send to our partners in other countries. So you have to sometimes think about combining those things. All right, this is the point at which I'm asking Naomi to come up and help me. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about this to kind of give you a sense of how social scientists think about some of these concepts with Naomi. And um, Valentin will come back this afternoon and talk about these concepts for natural scientists. Um, and so in terms of epistemology, kind of how we think about what we know and methods, social scientists have very different ways of thinking about how we know what we know, different methods, sometimes based on disciplines. Um, so some use experiments and surveys and others. Um, use interviews and ethnography. I think with um, epistemology, um, you're really saying what are the valid ways of knowing and for some people who um, are trained in the natural sciences, um, they might be unfamiliar with the notion that you can know things by talking to people, you can know things by doing participant observation, you can know things by living in a community um, and talking to people casually or formally or through focus groups or through participating in the same activities they do. So um, that's really a hurdle you have to get over early because usually you're trying to combine quantitative and qualitative data. And so um, everybody needs to be respectful about the different ways of knowing. 
And I, and I think that that's, a, that's been a really hard thing when the teams I've worked on with engineering and natural scientists to understand that social scientists can be so different. And sometimes, um, really, I get very defensive about, I tend to be a little more quantitative, and I can be talking with one of my more qualitative colleagues, and it can be a hard conversation. Um, so, and some social scientists take a very empiricist, positivistic terms that Val Valentin's going to talk about more later on, approach, and others are more interpretive, more participatory. Uh, some na social scientists are kind of try to be more like a natural scientist. Yeah, so you probably already know this, empiricist means what you can see. Um, and so I I'm in a department, for example, with economists and sociologists, and even, in, even though we're in both in the social sciences, um, economists tend to be looking more at behaviors um, rather than attitudes, beliefs, um, uh, other claims on knowledge, the way dialogue, discourse is developed, that's something um, sometimes they'll recognize, but oftentimes they're very suspect of, like, is that truly data? So um, a lot of sociologists, for example, aren't empiricist. They believe there's a lot going on that you cannot see. So the way you try to get at that is to look at the way how people describe um, what they do, and you can look at texts, and you can look at images, and you can look at, like the whole field of digital humanities. You can look at all the different social media forms and the ways in which we're constructing meaning out of the world. So um, empiricists sometimes clash with Interpre the interpretive approach, which is more you can look at all these different pieces of evidence of the way people will, uh, what will shape their behavior and what will shape their um, commitment to different policies, for example. I think that we also have different approaches to understanding the phenomena, and some people really think in cause and effect relationships parallel to natural scientists, and some people are more oriented to thick description. Some people focus on kind of the parts as um, an understanding them being reductionistic, and some people are really trying for a holistic understanding. Yeah. So. Um there are some social scientists that don't even believe you can study cause and effect per se because they don't believe there's any proof in, for example, what people say are their motivations and what they do because there are some people who believe we create our motivations out of what is socially acceptable in the culture we're in and re we redefine how we're motiva motivated by who we're speaking to. So that's just to show you an extreme on the difference between um, uh, the cause and effect notion might be, um, you know, you have an attitude that leads to a behavior. Um, and there are many social scientists that will say, no, it's actually the context that shapes your behavior, not necessarily something individual inside of you that shapes your behavior. So I guess what I think is important to say about this is the whole hypothesis testing approach is suspect by some social scientists, so you really have to talk about that whole hypothesis testing thing because the way many of us are trained in the positivistic model is that you try to reject the null hypothesis. So you try to reject what you think is happening and usually you're looking at a couple of variables. Um, as this goes up, this goes down, or this goes up and that goes up. Um, but uh, that's a very reductionist view um, for many social scientists. They think that's um, interesting, but doesn't won't get at your interdisciplinary contextual problem. So you have to bring in all of the factors that are at play. And so many people who do qualitative work, for example, have research objectives, not hypotheses, because the research objectives are a broader question about what is going on here. Why do people not prepare for drought? Why do people keep um, polluting this river basin even though they know um, the pollution will come back to haunt them? You know, something like that. Then you would look at maybe the history of the area, you'd look at the different land uses in the area, you'd look at the different reasons people use the land. So a hypothesis would be seen as a very narrow 
slice of what's going on. All right. Um, I think that, hey. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. That was really great. Uh, I asked her about five minutes ago to help me with that, and it's pretty amazing what she came up with in that short time, so I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll just kind of give you a quick sense of this. We're going to talk more about it, but after Aaron um, talks to you about qualitative interview methods, we're going to have you developing five groups of four participants, and then you're going to split up and do interviews. Um, but meanwhile, Erin is going to give you a sense of how to start to think about doing interviews.